That was footage from this past Wednesday when a group of us got together at 6 o'clock to stuff backpacks, getting ready for Family Fest. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. To see people serving, it's moving. It's just beautiful to see the body of Christ serving. A week from today is Family Fest. It's one of our major outreaches to the community. We're basically just going to throw the biggest party we know how to throw for the people that live around us to show them God's love. If you'd like to be a part of it, this coming Wednesday, again at 6 o'clock, if you'd like to serve in some capacity, we're going to get together and kind of give you some direction and divide up and who's doing what and kind of go over those kinds of things this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. But can we take just a minute before we go any further and just join our hearts and, and pray for this? Yeah. This is an opportunity to see people born into the kingdom of God, people maybe who have drifted away or never really knew that Jesus died for them, that God loves them. They don't know about it. Or it's, it's become something unreal to them. This is an opportunity for them to be refreshed, for them to come face to face with the love of Jesus through us. We used to agree with me. Can we take a moment? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to be a part of what you're doing. And Father, we just lift up next Sunday, Family Fest, Lord, this event. God, we lay it before you and ask for effectiveness at communing, communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you would help us get everything ready, that everything would fall into place, and that the people's hearts would be moved. Lord, we would not have a shortage of volunteers, people willing to serve. And God, I ask for an anointing on each person, whether they're directing parking, serving food, cleaning up trash, registering people, whatever it is, Lord, they would be anointed by your Holy Spirit to communicate the love of Jesus. And God, that there would be a drawing of people from our community who don't know you and a softening of their hearts. Lord, you'd begin to prepare the soil of their heart, that they would understand everything that we do in terms of the love of Jesus. This isn't about our church. This isn't about promoting ourselves. It's about expressing your love and lifting up the name of Jesus. Help us to be effective in that. Lord, we claim lost souls for your kingdom right now in Jesus' name. Where there's confusion, Lord, we speak clarity and revelation in the name of Jesus. God, as we have an opportunity to present the gospel, that there would be a response. That a spirit of blindness would come off of people's hearts. They would see clearly that they have a heavenly Father that loves them and sent his Son to die for them. And God, they wouldn't walk in darkness any longer, but they would be born into the kingdom of light next Sunday. And God, we praise you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. If you could continue to pray with us as we get ready for that. It's, it's going to be next week. It's going to be awesome. And we're going to see people's lives changed forever. Amen? amen. We've been doing a series for the last number of weeks that we're calling the Belvedere Syndrome. And what we've been talking about is serving. And we started off using the analogy of TV characters whose job it is to be a servant that they're in a servant role, but the way they go about it, everything they do reveals that they really don't understand what it is to have a servant's heart. And sometimes we in the church can fall prey to that same syndrome, that when we engage in service, it's not really how the Lord wants us to engage in service, that we serve other people, but sometimes we can make it about ourselves. We want people to admire us, to think we're great, to think we're talented, or to pity us and think, wow, they're a martyr, they're just a, such a servant, and we want to draw attention to ourselves. Or we do it with hostility and look down on the people that we're called to serve. Or we hold such a low view of serving that it's, we consider it something to avoid and try to get out of as often as possible. But we've been taking time to look at God's word and renew our hearts, renew our minds, and see what it, the Bible has to say regarding service. And we've talked about a number of things already. We talked about how serving, serving is how you walk in freedom. Serving is how you walk in love. Serving is how you walk in joy. Serving is how you walk in obedience and how you feel useful, how you walk in fruitfulness and purpose in the kingdom of God. Last week, we looked at a passage of scripture that showed us that having an opportunity to serve, it's not some unfortunate obligation as being a Christian. 
It's a privilege and it's an honor to get to serve. And that's how we need to view it. Last week, we also looked at 2 Timothy chapter 2 that talks about being a good soldier. And it says that a soldier doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who has enlisted him. That we want to please Jesus who's enlisted us, good soldiers for him. And we talked about the kingdom of God has got to come number one, first place. Just like a soldier, what his commander tells him to do, the instructions that he's given, what to do, where to go, that's got to come first place. Not second or third or fourth, whenever I get around to it, a good soldier responds and does what he's told. We talked about excuses that we make. Again, it's everyday life that poses a threat that entangles us and keeps us from being good soldiers. And we looked at Luke 14 and different excuses. And we said that excuses, they don't really excuse you, but they exclude you. All the things that we come up with, hey, I, I, I want to serve. I intend to serve. Someday I'm going to serve. I'm really going to get involved. I'm going to use my gifts. I'm going to use my time. Someday, as soon as I get the kids through, as soon as things at work start to as soon as my finances begin to, we've got all these excuses and it's just down the road, down the road, someday I intend to. And meanwhile, our life is slipping by. The goal is to get to heaven and have Jesus say what? Well done, good and faithful relaxer, excuse maker. If he's going to call us a servant, it means there had to have been some serving done along the way, right? He's not just going to wink at us and call us a servant. We're going to kind of know like, yeah, I got out of it, but thanks for, thanks for saying that, Jesus. To engage in serving. And each week we've kind of launched off reading from Galatians chapter 5. I want to do that again today. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It says this, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Jesus has set us free. There's freedom available through the cross, through the shed blood of Jesus, but there is an appropriate use of that freedom. Jesus has set us free. He's forgiven our sins. He's washed away our past mistakes. A number of us could talk about the bondage that he brought us out of, the filthy mess that we created for ourselves, that he rescued us from, that he's healed us spiritually, he's healed us emotionally, he's healed relationships, he's healed us physically. He has set us free and called us to walk in freedom, but there is an appropriate use to that freedom. He didn't set you free and heal you and remove all that bondage so you could lay on your couch and flip through the channels in the evening without having to worry about a whole lot of other stuff so you could really zone in on what you're watching. He set you free so you you could serve others in love so that you could be a part of some things that really matter. You can be a part of advancing his kingdom. That's why he set us free. Amen. We respond to what he's done by serving one another in love. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. By all the mercy that he's poured out on us, we respond by giving God our bodies, our lives as a living and holy sacrifice. God, here I am. All you've done for me. God, you're so good. You set me free. You rescued me. Lord, here I am. Take me. Use me. And whatever he has us do, it says that that is our act of service and that it's worship. It's worship. Part of this mind renewal, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the word serving, service, servant, that when we think serving, we need to think ministry. That's what's taking place. Here's another one for us. When you think serving, think worship. Those people stuffing backpacks, that was just as much worship as what we just did a minute ago, as lifting your hands and saying, Lord, I love you, praise you, thank you. Just blessed be your name, oh God. Stuffing a backpack, people down the hall, wiping kids' noses, that is just as much worship as clapping our hands and singing a song. When you think service, think worship. Picking up trash next Sunday, directing people to their parking spot, helping kids get in inflatables, serving, it's worship. God, I love you. Lord, just blessed be your name. Let your name be lifted high in my life. It's worship, and that's how we need to think of it. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. It took us about 25 or 30 minutes Wednesday to stuff 500 backpacks with school supplies. But enough people showed up to serve. If that was just me or a couple people's job, that would have been a miserable task. And it would have probably taken all day long to do all that. You get a bunch of people serving together. We knocked that out in 25 minutes, and it was fun doing it. We're interacting. We're talking. Serving together in the body of Christ is a wonderful, beautiful thing. 
And that's how we need to understand it to be. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. There is much more we'd like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You've been believers so long now, you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray for revelation and understanding in each one of us. Lord, let there be a tenderness and an openness to receive what you have for us. God, that we would move towards maturity, fruitfulness, pleasing to you. Lord, I ask you to use me. God, let my mouth be connected to your heart this morning. Lord, we just give you this time together in Jesus' name. Thanks. Amen. Uh, I, think, I think most of you guys know that my wife is pregnant, and uh, we did not intend for her to become pregnant. Um, not too long ago, we did a series on the Song of Solomon. And as a pastor... I feel like it's important to practice what I preach. <laughs> and so here we are. Um, we've got three kids, and the youngest one is almost five, so we really thought babies and diapers and bottles, we thought all of that stuff was behind us, and we were moving on to, like, phase two of being, being parents. We thought we were done with babies, had no intention to kind of reset the clock uh, on that kind of thing. But like I said... Um, here we are. And so I've had babies on my mind lately, kind of thinking in terms of babies and trying to remember what it's like to have a baby around the house. I've been trying to remember, okay, what's it like to have a baby? And if, if I remember right, it's a lot of work. If, yeah? That's what I was afraid of. I seem to remember it being a, a lot of work because babies, babies don't really... They don't really help out at all. They don't really do anything. And I'm not anti-baby. We're excited. We're thankful, all of that. Uh, so I'm not, I, I like babies. They're great. They're cuddly and all those things. Part of my story, my testimony, I used to be a baby myself. So I'm not, I'm not anti-baby in, in any way. It's just that they don't contribute. They don't, they don't do anything at all. There, there's nothing. The only thing they really do is make more work for other people. And they just kind of require other people's care and other people's work. Now, our other kids are young. They're young, but they can, they can do some things. They can uh, dress themselves and go to the bathroom on their own. Um, they can feed themselves. They, they can even pick up after themselves. Uh, occasionally do some chores and even help pick up after other people, but not babies. You have to do everything for a baby. You have to feed it. You have to wash it. You have to carry it around. You have, to do, you have to burp it. I mean, who can't burp on their own? You've got to help a baby burp. They need you to do everything for them. Babies are a lot of work. They require you to do everything for them. And if while you are doing everything for them, you don't meet their standards, they cry. They cry. And a baby cry is not like an adult cry. A lot of times on Sunday mornings, I, I will cry just during worship, just kind of one of the ways I find myself responding to God's presence. Uh, I'll get teary-eyed or during the altar time or something, I'll cry. Y you wouldn't know that, though, probably, unless maybe you saw me dab my eye or you're close enough to see a tear run down my cheek. I'm not like squalling and, and rolling around or anything. But that's not how babies cry. They don't cry silently to themselves. You, you never see a baby just kind of sitting there stoic with a tear running down its cheek. And you have to say, is something bothering you? Come on, you got to let it out. Let us know. If, if something's wrong, tell us. Come on, baby, what's going on? They, they let you know. They start to scream and cry and carry on. And it doesn't take much to get them to that point either. It doesn't take a whole lot to get a baby to cry. It's not hard to create the right conditions. Like, how can we get this baby to cry? Any little thing bothers them, they're going to cry. And they don't care if it inconveniences you. They don't care if it inconveniences other people around you. They don't care if it inconveniences everyone. If something bothers them, they're going to cry. They don't care where you are at the time. If you could be in a movie theater, out at a play, in a nice restaurant, 
in a church service, if something's bothering them, they're going to cry. They don't care when it is. If it's two in the morning, something's bothering them, you need your sleep, they don't care. They're going to scream until you get in there and do what they want you to do. They don't care. They don't care. You, you never see a baby crying in a church service and then realize where they are and they might be creating a C and then like try to tone it down. Oh. Like try to, just trying to bring it down a little bit. They don't care. And it's not that they're evil. It's not that they're, they're bad altogether. It's just that they don't even, they're not even aware of your needs. They have no awareness that you have other things going on in your life, that you have concerns, that maybe there's some stuff that you're dealing with. They're not even aware that you're sleep deprived and you really need a good night's rest. It doesn't matter. And again, it's not that they're evil. It's not that they're bad. That's, that's just being a baby, right? Am I remembering this right? Some parts? Okay. That's just part of being a baby. And in this passage of Scripture that we just read, I'll bring this around. This isn't just me coping with the situation I find myself in. In the passage of Scripture that, that we just read, the writer of Hebrews calls a group of people babies. Let me read verses 12 and 13 to you again. You've been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Now, again, acting like a baby, that's not a problem. That's not wrong, provided you are, in fact, a baby. But if you are a grown man or a grown woman and you act like a baby, now that's a problem, right? That's an issue. You need some correction. You need some training. You need someone to come alongside you and set you straight. It's not right for adults to act like babies. Have you ever seen an adult acting like a baby? I feel like some men just got nudged by their wives right there. (laughs) It's unpleasant. It's ugly. It's not a pleasant thing to see an adult acting like a baby. In fact, babies are wonderful. They're great. They're cute and all of that kind of stuff. But we can even use the term baby as something derogatory. Let's say after church today, everyone's kind of hanging out. We're fellowshipping and talking to one another. And Pete and I are talking. And you overhear us talking. And you know that we're talking about you. And we don't realize you can hear us. And as you, you listen in, you hear me say, yeah, that's the thing about them. They are such a baby. That's exactly, they're just a big baby. And you heard me talking about you like that. Now, your response is not going to be, Luke thinks I'm cute and I'm cuddly. (laughs) And when I'm cleaned up real nice, I've got that baby powder smell, baby lotion. I don't know what it is. Whatever makes a baby smell good when they're clean. Luke thinks I'm just like a baby. Or you're not going to think, you know what? I think Luke has a crush on me. I heard him calling me his baby. I'm going to have to talk to Beth about this. What your response is going to be is you're going to want an explanation or an apology or both. Why are you going around telling people that I'm a big baby? Babies are innocent. Again, they're wonderful. They're snuggly. All of those things. But we can still use that term as a way that can be almost insulting and offensive. And the reason is because we have a general understanding that over the course of time, people should become less and less baby-like and they should go on to maturity and put baby things behind them and move forward. That over the course of time, that is what should take place physically, and that's also what should be taking place spiritually, and that's what's being talked about in this passage of scripture that we just read, that the writer of Hebrews is looking at these believers, and by the evidence that he sees, what he knows about them, he has no choice but to say, you guys are a bunch of babies. In fact, he takes it a step further. Really, infants. You are being infantile. You need milk. And there's a couple of things that he sees in their life that is revealing of this. He's not just bitter and upset with them and and name-calling. He's addressing a situation by calling them babies because that's that's the reality of where they are spiritually. And he says, by this time, by this time, or by now, you've been believers for so long now, so there is a, a, a process that we go through. Over the course of time, it takes time to mature and grow up. So if you're here today and you're relatively new to the church or new to serving Jesus and you act like a baby, that's all right. Because, right, it's okay for babies, babies in Christ, to act like babies. But if you've been in the church and serving the Lord for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and you're still behaving like a baby, well, then we've got a problem, right? 
Some, some changes need to be made. And it's not, I'm not saying that to put anyone down or, or bring condemnation. It was just, we, we got to make some changes. We need to do some things differently so that we can grow up. So there's a, a, a passage of time here. You can't expect a baby to just mature instantly. You, you've got to give it time. So that's part of the process. The issue for these people was they had that amount of time. That whatever the allotment of time was, it had come and gone, and they were still baby. And there, there's something he sees in them that identifies them as being immature and baby-like. He says this. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. You've been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basics. They still needed other people always to be nourishing them. That that was what he looked at their life and saw. You guys are babies. I can see that because the mode you're still in is what can other people do for me? How can you meet my needs? How can you serve me? How can you come along and nourish me in some way? And that identified them as immature. They were babies because they were still in just self-focused. How can you provide and care for me? Immature. They're babies. And it doesn't say this, but I almost guarantee you, when you've got those kinds of believers, another baby-like characteristic in their lives was when something didn't suit them right, things didn't happen the way they wanted, they cried about it. Serving is a mark of maturity. You can look at your own life. You can just do a diagnosis right now. Am I serving? Am I involved? Where in my life is my focus helping someone else? Serving is a mark of maturity. If you don't see that, yeah, there's no condemnation. just need to make some changes. If I'm not actively involved in serving, serving is a mark of maturity. We have a strategy as far as how we want to see people mature and progress in their walk with the Lord here. And it's really simple, just three words. Live, grow, and serve. It's real simple. We want people to come to the newness of life found only in Jesus Christ. We want them to experience that new life, come to know Jesus, and even on Sunday mornings, that's what we do here on Sunday mornings. Those of us who already know Jesus, we get together and we celebrate and we sing because we walk in new life, that new life that's found only in Jesus. And then, the next thing, we want people to grow. We want them to be nourished from God's Word, get involved in a connect group, have someone pour into them, learn how to study God's Word. We want them to grow. And then, a mark of maturity is we want them to begin to serve, to learn how to come along some other people and begin to worry about their needs because serving is a mark of maturity. Fruitfulness, bearing fruit. Even uh, I've got some blueberry plants in my backyard that you're probably sick of hearing about. But I've bought them at, at different times. And so I've got some that I've had for like 11 years and some that I just got a couple summers ago. And they're at different levels of maturity. And the ones that are real young, I mean, they're doing good just to get leaves on them. They're doing, they're just barely coming up and they're kind of struggling along. They're not going to bear fruit because they're not mature enough yet. So right now, it's kind of a one-way focus. I fertilize them, I water them, I try to weed around them, I take care of them. But when they reach maturity, there's going to come a time where it's not just a one-way street, where they're going to begin to nourish me as well. There's going to be fruitfulness. Instead of just me always giving, 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 there's going to come a time when that plant reaches maturity, it's going to begin to give as well and provide for someone else. It's true all over the place. Maturity, serving, providing for someone else is a mark of maturity. Serving is a mark of maturity, but it's also serving is a means of maturity. Serving is a means of maturity. Again, I'm sorry, I've got babies on my mind. When Beth and I had our first kid, we had to do some growing up. Because all of a sudden, if you have kids, you can identify, all of a sudden, life changes. It, it shifts around a good deal. Instead of all your extra time and all your extra resources being about all, it's just you and what you want to do and how you want to spend your time, all that, it's all about you. How do you want to do things? It's up to you. But when you have somebody else to begin to care for, you start growing up pretty quick. You begin to mature. You begin to advance. And it's the same thing Spiritually. Serving others pulls you out of yourself and gets the focus off of you and helps you to mature. By beginning to prioritize someone else's needs, it brings about maturity. It's a mark of maturity, but it's also a means of maturity. When we focus on ourselves and what we want, people can become almost spiritual hypochondriacs, just worried about them and where they are and how things are going internally. Get your eyes on someone else, begin to focus on how you can help them, and you'll be shocked at how quickly you begin to mature and grow up in Christ. Begin to shoulder someone else's 
else's load and see how can I benefit you? Forget me, put me aside. And what can I do for you? You will begin to mature rapidly. Serving is a means of maturity. And it's true for each one of us. God has plans for your life. There's things he wants to do in you and through you. There's giftings he wants to see be used to make a difference in this world. It will never, ever happen until you start to mature and learn how to serve. You will never become Christ-like until you become servant-like. Because Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. That's the whole reason he came. He was a servant. You will never approach being Christ-like until you become servant-like. It's true for us individually, and it's true for us corporately. Let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. It says, it was he, we, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. How? How? as each part does its work. That we grow up no longer infants, we become mature. We're talking about the body of Christ. I believe this applies to the body of Christ in general, globally, but also us as a local body of Christ. We will begin to mature when we start seeing more people engage in service because the whole body is built up, strengthened, nourished in love as each part begins to do its work. And like we just said, it's a point of maturity where you begin to get really fruitful. And I believe that as we start moving in service and get God's heart, a servant's heart, that's why he has us talking about this, I believe, because there's a fruitfulness he wants to bring to us, but it's not going to happen until we get mature enough to be able to handle it. You can't have a whole bunch of babies together. You've got to have some mature people that can begin to, to move beyond themselves and care for them. And that's what we need here. More people serving, understanding what it really is to serve in the body of Christ. Moving out in service. Forget about me. Serving is a mark of maturity. It's a means of maturity for, for us as individuals and for the body of Christ. Let, let me tell you a pattern that you see in churches. And I think maybe, maybe more even Pentecostal churches th than others. A pattern you sometimes see is in the early days of the church, whenever it was formed, that you've got some people passionate about the kingdom, passionate about God, and just they would just want to get together and seek him, and that's what they do. And they experience wonderful times of God's presence. They experience a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are in operation. The Lord is moving and doing wonderful things. And it's great. It's fantastic. But over time, it kind of starts to fade a little bit. And they still get together. And they still worship and still kind of do the whole church thing. But there's not the same power as before. And there's not the same presence as before. You just kind of wish for the good old days and looking back. Remember how it used to be? I sure do. It was great. Let me tell you that this pattern isn't altogether rare in churches. I'll tell you one of the reasons that happens. When we begin to make experiencing the presence of God, which is a good thing, and experiencing the moving of the Holy Spirit, which is good, but when we begin to establish that as the goal without developing the heart of a servant to actually do any of the things that the Holy Spirit comes to deal with us to do, then we begin to grieve and stifle the Holy Spirit. If we don't develop a servant's heart to actually carry out the things the Holy Spirit comes to equip us to do, then what's he doing? He's not coming to entertain and just give us some warm fuzzies and send us back out to live life the same way we did last week. He comes to deal with our hearts, to show us things to do, and to give us the ability to carry out those things. He comes to equip us for ministry. Ministry is service. He comes to equip and deal with our hearts. Here's what I need you to do in my community. Here's what I 
need you to do with your neighbors. Here's what I need you to begin to do and serve in the body of Christ. And if we're just coming together to feel his presence and give each other a high five and do it again next week, I believe we grieve the Holy Spirit. We've got to develop the heart of a servant to carry out the things that he deals with us to do. Not just meet you again next week, same place, same time. I hope the Holy Spirit really puts on a show. No, he comes with purpose. And until we get in line with his purpose, it'd be futile for him to, to do anything, right? Christopher, you can come up to the guitar for a minute. Agreement. But that alone really isn't enough to transform a selfish heart into a servant's heart because it's not intellectual. We could be in agreement. We need to serve. I can see it is important to serve. But that's not really enough to change me into a Christ like servant, is it? I mean, come on. I mean, serving is important. That's probably not really great revelation to any of us. We spent the last month talking about it. It's probably all stuff you already know. So it's not just information and education. I can know that I need to serve. I, I can know I've got to care about other people more than I care about myself, but on my own, I feel like I'm incapable of doing that. I just drift back to myself. I'm so selfish. And, and then even when I do care about someone, it can be just kind of going through the motions. I know I should do this, but I feel like my heart isn't really engaged. So something's got to happen. Something's got to actually change. Something from outside of just us has got to change our hearts and really transform us from selfish heart to servant's heart. I read it earlier, but I want to read it again. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, something I believe the Holy Spirit just recently showed me in this passage of Scripture. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That passage is usually understood and translated as this is your response to all that God has done in view of God's mercies. And I believe that's appropriate. I mean, it's just logical. It's reasonable. All God has done for us. I mean, the least we can do is serve. Yeah. The least we can do is give him. So I'm on board with that. But this word in the Greek Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by, that word by, by the mercies of God. It can be translated and understood a couple of different ways. What we just talked about in view of, but also that the mercies of God are how you become able to give your body as a living sacrifice. That is the motivating and empowering factor that makes living as a, a sacrifice to God holy and pleasing and acceptable that's what makes it all possible. Because of his mercy, Lord, I can, give, I can give you myself in a way that I never could on my own. Just by your own mercy, Lord, come and change my heart. By his mercies, you can't do it any other way. There's no other way to really give yourself as a living sacrifice other than by the mercy of God. No one is so good on their own that they can just be this sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing and acceptable. Lord, here you are. Take all my motives and all that. None of us are that good. It's only by the mercy of God that we can even say, God, take me as a sacrifice. Change my heart so I care about your kingdom more than my own kingdom. Change my heart so I care about all these other people around me more than I care about my own little selfish comfort zone that I've tried to build for myself. Change my heart, Jesus, so I care more about my neighbor than making sure that, that I have my privacy and things go the way I want on a regular basis. It's by the mercy of God that's even possible. And I want to read one other passage of Scripture. Philippians chapter 2. We see the same thing. Dear friends, you always followed in my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. It's God who works in us to give us the desire in the first place, and it's God who works in us to give us the ability 
to follow through on the desire that was from him. It's all him. It's all him. So I don't know where you are on that spectrum as far as being a servant, actively serving, caring about others, advancing the kingdom of God. But wherever we are in that spectrum, God meets us right there. God, I want to care about others. I really do. That's no problem. God working in us to give us the desires that please him. God, I I want to serve you. I have that desire. I've just never been able to actually follow through and make good on on that desire. I want to. No problem. God can give you the power, the ability to also do what he's dealt with your heart to do. It's just a willingness on our part.